Hi everybody, welcome to my YouTube channel Dr. Srinivas Medical Concepts and my FB page Dr. Srinivas Concepts. This is Dr. Srinivas, neurologist from Andhra Pradesh, India. I am also the medical author of the book Focused Neurology. Today we are going to talk about a very interesting topic, a clinical oriented topic, the multiple cranial nerve palsy. So if we see multiple cranial nerves in a patient, how are we going to approach? The clinical approach to multiple cranial nerve palsy made easy. The clinical approach. Whenever we see a person with, with multiple cranial nerves involvement, the broad approach would be to find out whether it is within the brainstem or whether it is outside the brainstem. So whether, whether it is within the brainstem that is intramedullary or outside the brainstem that is extramedullary. So what are the points which will help us to differentiate whether it's an intramedullary or whether it's an extramedullary lesion. If it is an extramedullary lesion, there will be involvement of usually the adjacent successive cranial nerves. So generally there is an involvement of adjacent usually successive cranial nerve involvement 7th now, 8th now, 9, 10, 11 so successive involvement of cranial nerves if it is there it is usually a outside brainstem lesion that is extra medullary since the tracks are within the brainstem it will take a long time for it to impinge on the brainstem and for the development of the long track uh, long motor or sensory tracks so first there will be involvement of the cranial nerves adjacent cranial nerves usually successive and later only there will be involvement of sensory and motor tracts whereas if it is a brain stem there will be early involvement of the motor and sensory tracts the long tracts so in a brain stem lesion there is a usually ipsilateral cranial nerve palsy with contralateral hemiplegia third and fourth nerve palsy is in midbrain with contralateral hemiplegia 5, 6, 7, 8 cranial nerve palsy is in, in pons with opposite hemiplegia 9, 10, 11, 12 cranial nerve involvement in medial oblongata with opposite hemiplegia. So, ipsilateral cranial nerve palsy with opposite hemiplegia, that is the cross strokes, are uh, finding or are suggestive of brainstem lesion. Whereas, if it is an outside brainstem, extra medial lesion, usually the cranial nerves are involved first. Adjacent cranial nerves, usually successive. Successively, they are involved. Only after some time, only later, the long tracks, either the motor or sensory, get affected. First, the cranial nerves, later followed by the motor and sensory tracks. And a very important point in the extra medullary lesion that is outside the brainstem lesion is the involvement of the bone. Since it is coming out of the brainstem, it is going through the base of the skull, there will be involvement of the bone or enlargement of the foramina of the respective cranial nerves so that the involvement of the bone bone erosion or enlargement of the foramen of the existing nerves to understand the involvement of the foramen of the existing nerves or the bone erosion we need to know what are all the foramina in the brain in the base in the basal skull from which these cranial nerves emerge so this is the base of the skull we have the lesser wing of the sphenoid here we have the petrous part of the temporal bone here we have the cella tersica anterior to the lesser wing of the sphenoid we have the anterior cranial fossa in between the anterior cranial fossa and the posterior cranial fossa we have the middle cranial fossa and posterior to the petrous part of the temporal bone we have the posterior cranial fossa so what are all the foramina? We have the we have the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone wherein the first nerve originates. Then we have the optic canal from where the second nerve originates. Then we have the superior orbital fissure here wherein the three, four, six, and first division of the fifth nerve gets or gets originated. Then foramen rotundum where we have the fifth second division originates. Then the foramen oval where the third division of the fifth nerve originates. So if these get involved, we call it as a superior orbital fissure syndrome and the cavernous sinus syndrome. 
Then we have the internal auditory meatus from which the seventh and eighth cranial nerves involved emerge out. We call that as a cerebellar pontine angle tumor. Then we have the jugular foramen from where the ninth, ten, eleven cranial nerves originate. We call that as a jugular foramen syndrome. Sometimes it can go and extend into the twelfth nerve, which comes from the hypoglossal canal. So when there is an extra medullary lesion outside the brainstem, these foramina can get affected, and there could be bony erosions. So what are the causes? It could be trauma, traumatic. It could be infections, especially varicella zoster infection. It could be the meninges can be involved. The nerves have to pierce the meninges and the foramina to exist. So the meninges can get affected either because of the infections or because of the carcinomatous involvement, carcinomatous meningitis, or it could be vasculitis. A vasculitis is affecting multiple cranial nerves. It could be tumors, especially the nasopharyngeal carcinoma, which affects these cranial nerves. Tumors, especially the nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Then it could be tuberculosis, sarcoidosis, especially affects the cranial nerves. Especially, it has got a predilection for seven cranial nerves. Then we have all the CVJ anomalies, wherein it can affect the lower cranial nerves, like. Uh, like platina, like basilar invagination, platybasia, all the or arnal chiari malformation, all the CVJ anomalies. Then we have the Gulen Barry syndrome, a peripheral uh, neuropathy, which can selectively affect the seventh cranial nerve. Then we have the jugular foramen syndrome, as I said, and the cerebellar pontine angle syndrome. So all these extra medullary syndromes will cause bony erosion and the foramina of the there could be enlargement of the foramina, right? But what we see in the practice commonly is the involvement of the three, four, six nerves of thalmoplegia. So, what are all the causes wherein the three, four, six cranial nerves, the multiple cranial nerves, can get affected? So, let's see the multiple ocular motor nerve palsy. First, we have the brainstem strokes, as I said, midbrain, pons, medulla. In the midbrain, there could be Weber syndrome, where there is an ipsilateral third nerve palsy and opposite side UMN seventh nerve palsy. Or it could be a Pontine syndrome, a Milliard Gubler syndrome, wherein the sixth nerve and the seventh nerve element type will be there. Or it could be Wallenberg syndrome, wherein other than the twelfth nerve, that is 5, 7, 10, 11 can get affected. So all these brainstem strokes also can cause multiple cranial nerve palsies. Then we have the meninges, as I said, the meninges can get affected as the cranial nerves are emerging out. It could be meningitis, which could be because of infections or it could be because of the malignancy. The three, four, six nerves can get affected or there could be raised intracranial tension. When there is a raised intracranial tension, sixth nerve gets affected because as it comes out, it gets impinged on the clivus, on the clivus. So what happens, there could be a false localizing sign. Sixth nerve can get affected because of false localizing size. And because of the increase in pressure, there could be uncle herniation going and impinging on the third nerve. So when there's a raised six, raised intracranial pressure, sixth and third nerves can get affected. Aneurysms, aneurysms of the posterior PCOM, PCOM aneurysm can affect the third nerve. If there's a basilar artery aneurysm, it can affect sixth nerve. So aneurysms can cause the third nerve palsy, sixth nerve palsy. Then CP angle tumor, as I said, it can affect the 6th nerve, 8th nerve, 7th nerve and 5th nerve. And then trauma also can affect these cranial nerves. So we have the brainstem strokes, we have the meningeal involvement. And then we have the other causes where we have diabetes. Diabetes can cause microvascular affection, microvascular event affecting the, affecting more than one cranial nerve. Diabetes can cause microvascular uh, affection microvascular event which affects more than one cranial nerve or it could be when there is diabetes it is an immunocompromised state we can have fungal infections like aspergillosis or mucorails or cryptococcal infections and of course whenever the multiple cranial nerves especially the three four six are involved we always need to think of cavernous sinus superior orbital fissure and orbital apex the cavernous sinus lies just by the side of the cella persica 
and the sphenoid bone. In the body, it has got the internal carotid artery and the sixth nerve. In the world, it has got a third, fourth, sixth, first division of the fifth nerve, and sometimes posteriorly, second division of the fifth nerve. So, if there is a cavernous sinus syndrome, again, there could be multiple cranial nerve patches, third nerve, fourth nerve, sixth nerve, fifth nerve, first, and sometimes second division. Or it can go and extend to the superior orbital fissure where the sim symptoms are similar to the cavernous sinus syndrome, but there in the cavernous sinus syndrome, the first and probably the second division are involved, whereas in superior orbital fissure syndrome, only the branches of the first cranial nerve are involved, that is the nasal or lacrimal or frontal branches are involved. Or it may extend to the orbital apex, wherein along with the superior orbital fissure, it can affect the optic canal, the optic canal and the second nerve can get affected. So the superior orbital fissure 3, 4, 6, V1 and the optic canal can get affected. So there could be a multiple cranial nerve palsies with cavernous sinus or superior orbital fissure syndrome or orbital apex syndrome. Then there could be systematic malignancy which can cause Lambert Eaton myasthenic syndrome or there could be giant cell arthritis, temporal arthritis which also can affect the which can also affect the nerves. Gulenberry syndrome causes seventh nerve involvement, but a variant of Gulenberry syndrome, the Miller Fisher variant, can cause ophthalmoplegia. The Wernicke's encephalopathy, thymine deficiency, B1 deficiency also can cause global confusion, ophthalmoplegia, and ataxia. So there will be ophthalmoplegia in, in Wernicke's encephalopathy where there is B1 deficiency. Myasthenia gravis can cause a neuromuscular junction involvement, and the cranial nerves can get affected. So all these are the possibilities when there is optomotor nerve palsies. But the basic approach when we see a multiple cranial nerve palsy is to find out whether it is in the brainstem or outside the brainstem. Within the brainstem, usually the, the ipsilateral cranial nerve palsy with contralateral hemiplegia, the tracks usually get affected earlier. But if it is outside the brainstem, extra medullary, the the tracks get affected later, the involvement of the tracks that is uh, sensory or motor tracks get affected later. But there is an early involvement of the cranial nerves, the adjacent cranial nerves get affected. Usually successively they get affected and then there could be bone erosion or the enlargement of the foramen from, from which the cranial nerves come. So this is the fundamental approach when we see a cranial nerve, multiple cranial nerve palsy, whether it is a brainstem lesion or outside the brainstem lesion. I have enjoyed giving the lecture and I hope you have also enjoyed listening to this lecture. If you have any suggestions, you can kindly post on to my YouTube channel and please like and subscribe my YouTube channel Dr. Srinivas Medical Concepts and my FB page Dr. Srinivas Concepts. Thank you. Bye.